Hello and welcome to today's webinar, Advanced Process Filtration Using Porous Metal Technology. My name is Tracy Purdom and I am the Senior Digital Editor for Chemical Processing, which is producing this event. This event is sponsored by Mott Corporation. With increased focus on safety, efficiency, and sustainability, filtration is often overlooked part of plant optimization. In today's webinar, we will learn about porous metal and its capabilities in process filtration. This technology can be used to improve worker safety, throughput, downstream product quality, and environmental sustainability. To complement this discussion, we will have a live audience-driven Q&A session at the end of the presentation, so please submit your questions as they occur to you. Now, before I introduce our speaker, there are a few housekeeping issues that I'd like to review for you. On your screen, you should have five primary sections. The upper left or audio section allows you to adjust the volume of this presentation. Just hover over this section until you see the audio volume control and adjust the volume to your preference. Below that box is the Q&A and tech support box. At any time during today's presentation, you can type your question for our presenter right here, and we'll get to your question during our Q&A. If you're having technical problems, you can simply type in your question or concern here, and one of our technical engineers will assist you. Underneath the Ask a Question box is our handouts area. Here you will have access to a few PDFs, including the MOT filter re uh, feasibility testing and catalyst filtration application brief. Hope we, uh, we hopefully will have you take advantage of that. Go ahead and download those and, and, and peruse them at your convenience after today's event. In the largest section is where today's presentation slides will be displayed. And below the slides, you will see a live chat box. You can chat with your fellow webinar attendees or presenters using this feature. But please do not put your questions in this area. If you need a better view, you can enlarge a section by clicking on the box in the top right corner of the section next to the X. And if you accidentally close out of a section, you can get it back by clicking the Refresh button at the bottom of the screen. It's located to the left of the icons. This webcast will be archived. We encourage you to direct coworkers to the recorded presentation. It will be available at chemicalprocessing.com, and we're also going to send out a link with the on-demand version for you. Uh, one final note, we ask that you respond to the exit survey that we're going to post after the event. Your, question, your answers will help us to improve future events. And now I'd like to introduce our speaker, Patrick Hill, Chemical Processing Engineer and Project Manager at Mott Corporation. He specializes in advanced filtration system design and implementation for chemical processing and petrochemical applications. Welcome, Patrick. We're really happy to have you here today. Well, thank you, Tracy. I'm happy to be here. And thank you, everyone, for calling in. So at this point, we'll go ahead and get started. Like Tracy mentioned, the purpose of today's call is to talk a little bit about advanced process filtration, specifically using porous metal technology. So just a quick look at some of the objectives of today's webinar. So first, we'll, we'll have a high-level overview of porous metal manufacturing. We'll talk a little bit about porous metal process filtration design. We'll talk about the performance advantages of using porous metal in replace of some other types of filter technologies. We'll talk about the operational improvements you could gain at your plant by using this technology. We'll, of course, mention some design limitations of this technology. It's certainly not suitable for every application. And then we'll close by talking uh, a little bit about how, how you can determine if this application is right for your process at your plant. Before we do that, uh, as Tracy mentioned, this is sponsored by Mott Corporation. That's my employer, so let me just take 30 seconds to explain Mott Corporation to you all. So Mott Corporation has been around for 60 years. We specialize in porous metal filtration and flow control devices. Uh, on my end, on the process systems end, we look at large filtration systems for chemical plants, refineries, things of that nature. We also have departments who look at high purity applications and flow restrictors for a variety of uh, companies and industries. Okay, so now we'll get into, into the bit of it here. So starting with porous metal manufacturing, I'll take you through a rough overview of how we get from raw material to product. So porous metal products are made from powder, uh, and it's a special powder unlike some other porous metal technologies 
uh, porous metal filtration products use irregular shaped powders. And through compressing or 3D printing, these powders are formed into shapes. These shapes might be sheet or disc or tubes or cups or things of that nature. But they're compressed in a variety of different means and a variety of, of different powder sizes to achieve uh, certain specific products. So after they're compressed, we call that the green state of the product. In that state, uh, there will be porosity, but the product won't be very strong. It needs to be strengthened. And the way we strengthen our porous metal products is through sintering. So sintering is the process of, of heating the metal up to a temperature relatively close to the melting point of the specific material for a designed and engineered uh, time and temperature to produce a rigid structure. What happens there is that the individual powder particles begin to, to uh, neck is what we call it. They neck with each other, forming a little bit of a weld between one powder to another and ultimately locking in that structure. After, uh, after sintering, we will look at some performance testing to basically confirm that the product has reached the, uh, the performance state that, that it's needed to be. Now, I mentioned before that it's a variety of powders that, that we use. In this industry, porous metal powder can be down to a nominal pore size of 0 0.1 micron. It could also be as large as a pore size of 100 micron. So there's a wide range of possibilities there to, to use and, and to size based on a specific application. As for materials, far and away the most common porous metal material in our industry is stainless steel. Of course, there are porous metal, bronze, and brass out there as well. Stainless steel in, in MOTS industry is uh, uh, the vast majority of the products we produce, but we also have specialty alloys such as Hastelloy, Inconel, Monel, various other types of nickels, titaniums, and some very developmental alloys. The summary here is that there's a suitable material choice for each application, and learning a bit more about the application, you can make an intelligent choice on that material. So one thing that's new in, in our industry in the last couple of years is the ability to introduce 3D printed products. I know in, in other industries, 3D printed plastics have become pretty common. I know myself as a hobbyist, I have a small 3D printed, uh, printer at home that I like to make uh, various little trinkets with. But uh, here at Mott, we do have a laser sintering 3D printing machine. Uh, and that gives a, a, a whole new range of possibilities to porous metal filtration and flow control devices. Prior to 3D printing, we were really restricted by common manufacturing methods. Like I mentioned, producing things such as sheet or tubes or discs or cups. With the introduction of a 3D printer, we now can produce complex geometries. And you can see a couple of them on the screen. So on the left image, you can see two cones. What's interesting about these two cones is they're both 3D printed cones. They both have the same relative porosity and approximate pore size. It's a little difficult to tell in such a small picture, but the cone on the left is printed with a geometric pattern. So it's effectively a solid piece of stainless steel with designed and engineered holes you know, distributed throughout the cone. The cone on the right is a more traditional porous metal product, so it has a, an irregular shape and a regular amount of pores, uh, also 3D printed, um, distributed amongst its length. Both of these products can be used for different, uh, different applications, of course, but the summary here is that with the 3D printer, there's a wide range of possibilities available. So at the bottom of the screen, I, I listed just some advantages and disadvantages. The advantage here, like I mentioned, is geometry constraints have really gone out the window. With the introduction of the 3D printer, we, we, can, we can print really, really complex geometries. We can print multiple densities, switching layer after layer between solid, solid stainless steel, very porous stainless steel, very tight stainless steel, uh, and so on and so forth to really achieve a complex solution. The 3D printer allows us to integrate support structures directly into the part and also process connections into the part. So in some cases, we're able to eliminate uh, complex joining methods such as electron beam welding or maybe some uh, very specific tolerance press fitting type uh, of, uh, of connections required for our porous material. Now, there are disadvantages, of course. Just like other 3D printers out there, um, 
porous metal sintering machines do have a limited size. They can only print approximately 12 inches by 12 inches, varying by manufacturer. Material at this point is limited only to the amount of development uh, that's been done, uh, but there are some restrictions on material, again, because of the ability to sinter. And finally, there's a, a little bit extra work that needs to be done. So a porous metal disc is a relatively easy thing to manufacture. It can be produced on an axial hydraulic press by the thousands or even millions. But 3D printing requires engineering models and um, you know, engineering tooling to, to get that 3D printer up and running. For the remainder of the presentation, however, I'm going to step a little bit away from 3D printing and I'm going to focus on uh, process filtration elements. Uh, some folks call these candles, some folks call these filter elements, but really what we're looking at for the rem remainder of this presentation is cylindrical filter elements. So porous metal filter elements are a little bit different than maybe some of the other technologies out there such as polypropylene or fiberglass or ceramic. Biggest advantage, uh, advantages are listed here. Starting with the top, these elements are, are cleanable. So uh, as they build up with cake or maybe even see cake embedding into the surface of the media, they do have the ability to be removed from the filter and ultrasonically cleaned or chemically cleaned or maybe even heat treated depending on what they've been exposed to. They're durable. At the end of the day, these are stainless steel. Now, they may be 30% porous stainless steel, so they may not have the yield strength uh, of a truly solid piece of stainless steel, but they are metal, and therefore they can be welded. They can uh, withstand some fairly significant bending forces, collapse pressures, and burst pressures. Corrosion resistant, so stainless steel elements do have some level of corrosion resistance, but we also, like I mentioned a couple slides earlier, have other alloys available depending on specific chemistries. You know, we may use a Hastelay C series, whether it's a C22 or a C276, and applications where we have uh, certain corrosion um, concerns. So with the amount of variability we have, we can design around corrosive processes. These elements are self-supporting. They may sound intuitive. Uh, they are metal, so therefore they should be fairly strong and self-supporting. But because they're self-supporting, it lets us do some interesting things that we'll talk about a little bit later. And that is uh, basically being able to use the inside of the element as valuable space to the filtration process. Elements come in a wide variety of connections. Because they are metal, we can, we can weld virtually anything onto the ends of them. So it may be something as simple as a standard double open-ended element, or maybe something complicated with an integral venturi, some external threads, and some internal threads. At the end of the day, we're just simply welding a, a machined component onto the end of these elements. Depending on the size and configuration, these elements can handle up to 3,000 PSI in differential pressure. That's fairly significant, and that's not something that other technologies can handle. So if we are at a high pressure process and a high differential pressure process, we can look to porous metal to provide the strength we need while also meeting our filtering needs. As far as temperatures are concerned, porous metal filters have been used in cryogenic temperatures uh, all the way up to 1700 degrees Fahrenheit. That's the recommended top of the range for Hastelloy X in a reducing environment. I mentioned earlier on porosity, but uh, the average porosity range for a porous metal filter element is between 0.1 and 100 microns. So because we have such a large range, we can certainly size to specific particles and particle size distributions. Lengths range from 20 thousandths of an inch all the way up to 10 feet. So again, a wide variety depending upon the needs of the specific process. And that's really what I'm trying to summarize with this last bullet. Porous metal filter elements have a wide range of possibilities, process connections, and can handle a wide range of pressures and temperatures. So they're very flexible, and they can be customized to meet the needs of your filtration demand. Briefly, I'm just going to talk about uh, three types of liquid filtration. I'm going to introduce you all to, to these three technologies, and then I'm only going to focus on one technology moving forward. 
We do have a time limit. I know it's Friday and you all probably want to, to get to your weekend fairly quickly. So I'll keep this narrow for you. We'll focus on just one type of technology, but I do want to introduce these other types. So the first and most common type of filtration that you probably are all familiar with is dead end filtration. This is a situation where a flow travels through a filter element, either from the outside to the inside or the inside to the outside, deposits its solids on the surface of the element and permeates through the wall thickness as a clean filtered product. We call that the filtrate. This is the most common type of liquid filter. And this is something as simple as uh, the string wound filter. Uh, if you have a well at home, you have, you have one of these filters in the, you know, maybe in the basement of your house if you live in the Northeast like me or, or in some other configuration. Next type of filter would be what's called a low velocity cross flow filter. Now this is arranged vertically like a dead end filter, but here the elements are open on both ends and the outlet is often connected back to the reactor or back to some sort of starting state for your process. This acts as a recirculation loop, and it's really used in situations where you have very dense solids because it allows those solids to settle down at the bottom of the vessel, uh, or it's used in situations where um, your solids produce a cake that is initially permeable but quickly becomes impermeable at higher thicknesses. Thicknesses. The advantage of this filter is because it recycles, it does have a little bit of a concentration element to it, and you can control the thickness of the cake uh, based on your cleaning cycles. The last type of filter I'll talk about is a high velocity cross flow filter. You may have seen these before, but these are typically arranged horizontally. They typically use small diameter tubes. They look very similar to a shell and tube heat exchanger. Uh, but what's happening here is that we have very high velocity fluid being pumped through uh, this stream. Now, if we're looking at, at numbers, we may uh, have flow 10 times higher than that of the low velocity cross flow filter. What's happening here is because we have such turbulent flow on the inside of the elements, we never really give the solids an opportunity to build a cake on this filter. So the solids are constantly being stripped away from the surface and clean filtrate is pulled through the walls of the, of the porous media um, while that feed continues to concentrate. A rule of thumb average here is that the filtrate flow rate is typically about one-tenth of the feed flow rate. So again, the, the main application of the high velocity cross flow is a situation where you have submicron particles those submicron particles, when uh, formed together into a filter cake, are, are very, very resistive hydraulically. So they form a cake that is uh, extremely impermeable, and it would be inefficient to use them in a dead-end filtration case. You just uh, wouldn't, wouldn't be cycling uh, all that well or all that um, efficiently. So in a high-velocity high cross-flow case, you give yourself some time to concentrate uh, while still being able to produce some filtrate. Okay, so like I mentioned, I'm going to focus uh, on inside out filtration, but specifically for a dead end filter from here on in. So you may, you may know there are two types of filtration. Let me just bring all these things up on the screen for you here. Inside out or outside in. When I say inside out, what I'm, what I'm saying here is that the, the dirty feed, the fluid with solids, is passing through the inside of a porous metal filter element and the clean filtrate is permeating through that element to the outside. The advantage of inside-out filtration is that you get a very even deposition of cake along the inside surface of the element because the cake is being formed strictly on hydraulic resistance. You also have no bridging. Bridging is uh, from one cake on the outside of one element interacting with a cake on the outside of another element. Since all of the solid particles are retained inside the elements, there's no opportunity for those cakes to interact with each other and therefore block off flow channels or uh, really degrade your filter performance. The other advantage to inside-out filtration is that you're typically playing to the strength of the porous metal element. A rule of thumb average is a porous metal element is about five times stronger in the burst direction than it is in the collapse direction. So in this case, when we're filtering inside-out, 
we're looking at the burst pressure being the limiting component on the element, and therefore we're playing to its strength. If we look at a case of outside infiltration, this is a typical filter design, uh, something that everyone in the industry is used to, so there's a certain level of comfort there. The other benefit of an outside infiltration design is that the cake discharge, meaning removing the cake from the element, is easier because there's a little more space to work with. Ultimately, the summary here is that you can design a proper liquid filter system to either inside out or outside infiltration, depending on the specific process and the specific performance requirements. So we'll just take a detailed walk through how an inside out liquid filter works. Now at MOT, we call this the LSI filter. That stands for liquid solids inverted. Inverted because the tube sheet in this filter is located down near the bottom of the vessel, where more commonly for an outside in filter, that tube sheet's located near the top of the vessel and the elements are hanging down below it. You can see from the schematic here, this is just a very simple representation with three filter elements in a vessel. I'm going to briefly walk through the filtration step, how this filter works, and then we'll spend a little bit of time talking about the backwash step, which is the cleaning of the elements. So first step for filtration, of course, is to open the inlet and outlet of the filters. Uh, upon doing so, you can start to initiate flow into the bottom of the filter. We call this the heel, that's the region below the tube sheet. So we flow dirty uh, feed into the heel until it's full. And then that feed starts to travel up through each of the filter elements. And just for a, a rough size perspective, there could be one element in a filter vessel. There could be 500 elements in a filter vessel. It all depends on the process and the desired flow rate. As we start putting feed through the inside, the ID of each element, we get solids depositing along the inside surface of the element. This is forming our filter cake. Clean filtrate is then passed through the element to the outside above the tube sheet. Uh, this region is called the filtrate region. And that filtrate is going to build all the way until the uh, liquid level shown in this schematic up near the top outlet valve. As soon as we reach that level, flow through the flow goes through the outlet valve down to uh, whatever is next in the process. In most cases, this is a single pass filter. So in an application where uh, the fee or the filtrate is your product, you know, you're pretty much done at this point and ready to cool or bottle or do whatever you need to do. We're going to continue in that state until uh, one of two things is reached. Uh, either the maximum differential pressure is reached as designed by an engineer like me, or uh, time is reached. Now, certain, certain applications may want to backwash their filters at very specific time intervals, maybe every one hour, every 12 hours, whatever it may be. And other applications prefer to let the filter build up to its terminal differential pressure uh, and then initiate a backwash automatically from there. So in order to initiate a backwash, we obviously have to close those two valves that we opened at the very beginning. So we isolate both our inlet and outlet, effectively isolating the filter at this point. The next thing we do is we uh, open a backwash gas inlet valve. So uh, in this scenario, we're talking about what's called a full shell backwash, where we're relying upon the filtrate or some other fluid to help us in cleaning the filters. So we open this, this valve and we pressurize that white space in the vessel above the liquid. That's called the gas pocket. It's a very specific uh, engineered space because the gas is, is very important in this backwash process. Gas travels in and it pressurizes that pocket. Now the pressure here is typically about 10 PSI above the terminal differential pressure that we ended our filtration cycle at. And this pressure is, uh, this pressure and volume of gas actually is sized specifically to provide uh, the amount of force needed to have a sudden, uh, nearly instantaneous cleaning of the vessel, which I'll talk about in a minute. Once we reach the desired gas pressure, we open the outlet valve on the bottom of the vessel. Now, this valve is typically large diameter, and it's typically a very fast-acting valve. It's fast acting because we want to initiate a cleaning extremely quickly. 
if the cleaning is too slow, we risk not dislodging all of the cake from the inside of the elements. So we typically use a very fast acting valve and it's large diameter because we have a very high concentration of solids being discharged through this line. So we want as much room to work with to prevent any sort of clogging or fouling. Once that valve is open, there's a very sudden discharge of the cake, again, using the expansion of the gas as the primary force. And that cake falls down into the heel of the vessel and ultimately out the vessel and down to whatever is next in the process. Most commonly in a filter like this, we have what's called a backwash receiver downstream. The purpose of that tank, if you will, is it's to recover this high concentration slurry and allow the user to do what they want from there. Sometimes we have users who, who let it settle in that tank and then pump feed back to their reactor. Sometimes we have users that recover or, or dispose from there. So I talked a lot about operation, but let's go over what this gets you. So the advantage of a porous metal filter is it's a single pass filter that can, ex that can achieve very high performance values. So in most operations, we are less than 20 ppm solids in our filtrate of this vessel. And that's coming from weight percents of maybe one to two weight percent, maybe even higher in some cases. We recover up to 98% of the valuable filtrate and 98% of the catalyst if we're looking at a catalyst recovery application. All of this is done with an LSI filter with no additional rotating parts. It's also a closed loop filter, which we'll talk about in a minute. So when compared to some other filter technologies, such as a filter press, uh, the porous metal filter has some improvements from sustainability and worker safety. It's a closed loop system, so operators are not exposed to whatever your chemical process is inside the filter. It has the ability to be fully automated. I mentioned before that cleaning cycles are initiated based on predetermined situations such as differential pressure or time, and they require no operator intervention. In most cases, these filters go months or years without a shutdown, and they can go many years without any element replacement at all. So what does this get you? It reduces your waste, first and foremost, because we're using robust reusable filter elements. We're not using disposable media or media that needs to be replaced often. We also have the ability to online clean via the backwash method that I just mentioned. And then over time, as we do have uh, very small fines uh, becoming entrapped within the pores of the media, we do have the availability to offline clean this media and bring it back to its original specification. And finally, we can reduce operation costs because we have no rotating parts. The system's easy to maintain. All we have is uh, about a dozen valves and instruments and a couple of vessels. Now, I talked a lot of good things about porous metal filters. Uh, and a lot of benefits for you at your plant. But let me just talk quickly about some applications that may not be suitable uh, for this technology. So first is applications with high solids loading. So I mentioned before, on average, we typically filter about one to two, maybe up to five weight percent solids or less. Any higher than that, and what ends up happening is you need a, a filter system that is extremely large in size and therefore extremely large in capital cost to the point that this technology may not be the most economical. Highly viscous fluids, uh, because we have um, very, very fine pores, we do have inherently uh, a large hydraulic resistance across those pores. So when we have highly viscous fluids, that pressure drop becomes fairly significant and that cuts into the total operational window we have to build a filter cake. So highly viscous fluids are one area where we need to understand the problem a little bit better to determine if this is a suitable application. Sticky or easily compressible solids. Now I know sticky is a common industry term and I'm sure you all know what I mean when I say that, but what I'm really referring to here is solids that adhere to the surface of the media very well and therefore become very difficult to discharge from the surface. So sticky solids would be difficult to backwash 
and therefore may affect performance on the second through last filter cycle of an operation. Easily compressible solids are a challenge for a different reason. We may be able to filter these solids very well, but as they start interacting together, they start compressing and closing off flow channels and becoming very resistive hydraulically, and therefore we end up reaching our terminal differential pressure much faster um, than what we would like to see. Again, this means that we may need to have a filter that is much bigger than, than other applications and therefore maybe not economically feasible. Next one here is low temperature and pressure applications. Now you may say, why do I have this listed here? What's, what's the problem with low temperature and pressure applications? There's no problem at all. Uh, but the fact of the matter is we have a, a, a porous metal filter, uh, which is certainly more expensive than a polypropylene or string wound filter. These should be used in applications where you need to rely upon the strength and or resistance of this material in certain environments. A low temperature and pressure application may be benign enough that you can use a different type of technology. And last one here is a demanding footprint area versus required filter area. That's a lot of words, but what I'm trying to say here is uh, there are other technologies such as pleated media that are much more efficient in terms of filter area per unit of element volume. Um, porous metal elements are, are not pleated, and if they are pleated, they're very difficult to clean online. Um, so in this case, if you have a constraint where you have a very small uh, location in your plant that you're looking to install a filter, but you need a very high amount of filtration area, this may not be the best application. So I talked about those. How do we know if the application is right? Or maybe we have some of those things on the previous slide that we're a little bit concerned about. How do we go about evaluating if this porous metal technology is suitable technology uh, for your chemical process? Well, the best practice I can give to you is to use a graded approach to the design. A porous metal filter system is a fairly significant capital expense, and therefore it would be foolish to rush into that expense without fully understanding how the unit is going to perform, and what the improvements in filtrate quality and operational uh, flexibility uh, you would gain from it. So this graded approach typically starts with a lab level test, and Tracy mentioned we did include a little bit of a handout for you for some more information about this lab level test. I'll touch on it briefly in a coming slide, but this test is a very small portion of the capital investment, and its purpose is just to do that quick go or no go type check. Is this application right? Can we move on to the next stage of thinking about it a little more? That next stage would be pilot testing where we're looking at a more robust unit. We're testing on site. Again, I'll talk about the, the specifics of pilot testing in a minute, but that was usually what happens after laboratory testing. After we do our testing, either pilot or laboratory testing or both, the next best thing to do is take time to design the system. But too often, there are situations where uh, you're trying to design the system while also needing to fabricate or deliver the product. And that may work sometimes, but usually what happens there is that during the design or maybe even after the design is finished, some changes need to be made that end up affecting the design of the vessel. And then we have hardware changes and schedule delays. And you know, those things can really be avoided by designing up front and, and you know, really knowing what the system is going to look like before we take it to that next level of detail. And then only after you go through that, those activities are you really right to implement your fully engineered and lab tested solution. We have some data and we've done some real good engineering to show that this system is going to work and it's going to perform at a, at a very high level at your plant. So like I mentioned, easiest thing to start with is a, is a feasibility study. This is a lab level study. It's done on a very simple porous disk. And like I mentioned, it's really that first check on uh, feasibility of an application. So what this level of testing gets you is, it, it tells you a lot about the size of the solid particles within your feed stream. And not only the size, but the morphology or shape and composition of those particles. Those two things are important for selecting the appropriate media grade. 
Now, I didn't mention this before, but porous metal filters are barrier filters, and they really rely on the cake to do the bulk of the work for them. So selecting a media grade is very important to ensure that those solid particles do not become entrapped in the surface of the media, and that they stay on the surface so they can contribute towards building the filter cake. The other things we can confirm in this lab level testing are the optimal operation flow, and therefore from that we can calculate the necessary filtrate area. Finally, we can do a brief look at backwash or back pulse effectiveness. If we have a solid cake, like I mentioned before, that maybe compresses easily or is sticky and doesn't want to release from the metal. Provided the filter feasibility test looks pretty good, uh, the next level of testing is pilot testing. Now, pilot testing is going to look at the same sorts of things, but it is a very different type of test. So this test is a much bigger unit, as you can see on the screen here. It tests the exact element shape in a full-size unit. So we have the same size, the same shape, the same media grade, and the same material that would be used in the proposed commercial size filter. This testing occurs on site at the plant using the exact process fluid. So there's no risk of fluid property changes from bottling and sending to laboratories here and there. The test is performed by the end user experts, so by plant personnel, with the guidance of filter experts, you know, maybe someone like me or someone similar in a different organization. We have the ability to have the system be manually operated or fully controlled automatically for the ability to test you know, dozens or maybe even hundreds of cycles if that level of testing is important for a specific application. So again, the, su the summary here is that it provides us more valuable data, uh, data that we can use to do the sizing of our full unit and to perform the necessary engineering. So once we have the lab data and the pilot data, it's time to sit down and take out your pencil and really design the system. The advantage of designing a system with this lab level data is that you can really reduce your conservatism and narrow in on an optimal design. If you skip the lab level testing, you may end up finding that you're designing a filter that is potentially too big for your application, or if you're too optimistic, you may design something that's too small and therefore will not perform satisfactorily when it comes time for installation. So only after gaining the data can you really produce an intelligent and cost-effective design this design is, means less overall cost to the end user and really cuts down the risk of this large capital project. That's really the end of, of my presentation here. I'm right where I want to be, leaving some time for questions. So let me just go through quickly some conclusions here. So we learned a little bit about porous metal filtration. We have the capability to filter down to submicron particles. That's 0.1 micron. Uh, we can improve operator safety through the closed loop technology that I mentioned. We can reduce our environmental impact by having elements that are reusable, that are cleaned uh, online and offline when needed. We can increase our throughput by reducing maintenance and downtime with the filter operating uh, nearly continuously for months or years at a time. We really can produce a, a lot more product in that window. And again, porous metal filters are suitable for a wide range of temperatures pressures, and applications. How do we know if the application is right for us? This was the second half of the presentation. The best thing to do is test. Uh, data really, really helps with this decision making. So starting with a filter feasibility test is really a great step. And then only after that test is it smart to move into design. So Tracy, that's it on my end. Uh, I, at this time, I'd be happy to answer any questions that have come up during the presentation. All right, Patrick, a great presentation. For the time frame you had, you gave us a comprehensive view of this, so we appreciate that, and I know the audience members do. We have a lot of questions coming in here. So I'm going to launch with the first question. Um, is this application suitable to precious metal catalyst recovery? So the answer there is a astounding yes. Um, this is a great application for precious metal catalysts, whether we're talking about platinum or palladium, or maybe even some rainy nickel or similar type catalysts. The advantage of the porous metal technology is that we get extremely, extremely low PPM solids uh, in our filtrate, which really means we're capturing all of that valuable catalyst to either be reused or recycled. 
it means more money to the end user ultimately. All right, thank you for that answer. Um, how do you know if this technology is compatible with uh, the process, uh, this person says, with my process fluids and solids? So um, is it a case-by-case -case basis that you go in there and figure that out? It certainly is a case-by-case -case basis. Now, uh, I can speak only from MOT specifically. Uh, I, I'm not sure how uh, other organizations operate, but MOT Corporation has a very large install base. We have about 600 large liquid filter systems deployed globally. And because of that, we have looked at a lot of different processes. So it's fully possible that your process has already uh, been looked at and tested. But really, the best way to know if the process is compatible is by doing that initial cost-effective test. Uh, there's, there's, the data that you get from that test is really invaluable to the overall process. And that works out well because you have that, that database of what you've already done to help guide the, the, those folks through what they need to do. So that's uh, exactly. pretty interesting. All right, next question here. How do you address corrosion or corrosive environments? A lot of our, our uh, audience members probably have to deal with that. Yeah, so this is a, a tricky one, and it's really at the balance of the end user. So my preference for addressing corrosion would just simply be choosing a media that is inert with the process and therefore will not see corrosion. So, you know, we may choose, like I mentioned, a Hastel AC-22 or a Hastel AC-26 element, and maybe even Hastel vessels. Um, of course, the cost difference between Hastel and stainless steel is fairly significant. So the end user may be willing to accept a reduction on lifetime of the element in return for a, a lower initial cost. But the best way to ensure uh, you're handling corrosion successfully is by first selecting a material and then selecting you know, the design life after that. All right, thank you. Um, are there size or flow limitations on the LSI design? So there are, there are rough envelopes that we prefer to operate in. So from a flow perspective, I'll address that um, by the term flux. And flux, what I'm really referring to is volumetric flow uh, per unit filter area. So an LSI will typically operate at a flux between 0.1 GPM per square feet to maybe 1 GPM per square feet. Um, that's the range where it's operated. I would say that we have applications that have a, a flux much, much lower than 0.1 GPM per square feet. And we also have applications where the flux can be justified to be significantly higher. Uh, the summary there is that we need to have the data to show that our solids cake is going to remain open and permeable, and therefore we can justify building a thicker cake. On the solids concentration front, uh, I would say that Solids concentrations less than two weight percent solids are very, very easy. Between two to five weight percent solids becomes challenging, again, depending upon the, the type of solid particle and how they form a cake. And above 5% requires some additional care and thinking before we really go ahead and select the filter design. Now, this question is, is piggybacking on what you just said. Um, what are the ranges of solid concentrations suitable for the LSI? Yeah, so I would say um, no-brainer no there would be 0 to 2 weight percent is fine, 2 to 5 is okay. Above 5 weight percent, um, I would say we really need to test to know for sure. Well, Patrick, that's all the audience questions that we have here. I appreciate all of the work you did to present this for us. Um, uh, a great presentation. Oh, we do have a few coming in, a few questions coming in here. Maybe I can uh, zip those in. We have plenty of time. Do you mind? Sure. Do you mind if no, I throw no, a few more at, at you? Oh, oh great. Yeah. Um, and any thoughts about submicron filtration systems? Yeah, so submicron filtration can be tricky uh, from two perspectives. If the solid particle size distribution is very narrow, meaning that um, the, the minimum particle size and the maximum particle size are very close to each other, that's a situation where we're going to form a very resistive cake. In that type of situation, I would recommend a high-velocity cross-flow filter. 
a filter that doesn't result in any cake buildup, and therefore we're not concerned about the solid particles interacting together. But I would say if our particle sizes are uh, 0 0.1, 0 0.2 micron or higher, we should be in good shape to achieve that. Okay, we have a, a fairly lengthy question here, so bear with me. For stainless steel porous metal filters used in FCC4 stage separator service, do you believe 3D printing of elements would reduce the risk of failure by reducing or eliminating the number of circumferential, and that's hard to say, welds used in fabricating the element? And do you have any uh, quantitative data showing strength of tradition versus, uh, traditional versus the 3D printed filter elements? So the second half of the question, no, I don't have that quantitative data. This is an interesting thought experiment. Um, it, and it wouldn't necessarily just be limited to FCC fourth stage. Uh, I believe reducing the number of welds will, of course, reduce the risk of points of failure. Um, so in theory, this question is, is pretty good. I would think, yes, if we were able to make a seamless long diameter or, or long and large diameter seamless element, whether it's 3D printed or some other method, that element would be uh, stronger. Obviously, it wouldn't have the weld to worry about. Uh, often, the return that you're looking for there, and especially on a fourth stage separator, is you're trying to balance pressure drop. And sometimes, those seamless elements are much thicker in terms of wall thickness and therefore the differential pressure across that element is significantly higher than the welded element which is made from thin sheet. So it's a balance. Uh, you're really trying to balance strength versus pressure drop and flow requirements. But in theory, I think yes, if you were able to keep the thickness the same and reduce the welds, you would have a, a, a stronger product. All right, thank you for that thoughtful uh answer to that question there. And again, thank you for taking the time to field all of our questions and offer this presentation today. Uh, audience members, did you like the presentation? Let us know your thoughts by answering our brief survey. That will be posted to the screen here momentarily. Your candid answers are not only appreciated, but they help us craft future events. Uh, remember, this webcast will be available on chemicalprocessing.com. Feel free to log in and view it again or encourage your, your colleagues to view it as well and take advantage of those handouts uh, we have for you. We also hope that you'll visit chemicalprocessing.com to gain access to even more tools and resources aimed at helping you achieve success. On behalf of Patrick and the team over at Mott Corporation, thank you for your attendance. Hope you have a great day and a great weekend.